Well, good morning. This is Gary Wickert with Matisse and Wickert and Lair, and this is the next in our series of webinars on automobile insurance subrogation. As you may recall, we started with, uh, I think it was Texas. Um, no, we started with a, a national, a one that covered all 50 states in, in an in a overview. It was, it was a flyover of all 50 states. And then we discussed um, uh, some and took a poll on 10 states that uh, the attendees, and there were over 600 attendees at that webinar, and the poll said that uh, picked 10 different states, and California, I think, is the third or fourth in our series, and so we are now doing a flyover of California, and we'll be descending to about 1,000 feet as we fly over Sacramento, L.A., San Francisco, San Diego, and talk about the nuts and bolts of California automobile insurance subrogation. Before we get started, I just wanted to point out that we do have a book available. Uh, trust me, I'm not peddling the book. We make very little on the book, but the book is going to cover um, and fill in the cracks and the uh, uh, the areas that we're not able to get in this one-hour webinar. Uh, automobile insurance subrogation is some 1,500 pages, and it covers all 50 states. It's an excellent resource that um, goes into every aspect of subrogation and uh, probably a dozen different issues in each state that affect insurance subrogation when dealing with automobile insurance that we will not be covering simply for lack of time uh, in this webinar. So that's a good resource and it's available through the um, Juris Publications website shown on the screen or you can get it from our website. Insurance subrogation involving automobile insurance is critical, and there are 270 million, 275 million reasons why. Understanding the intricacies and vagaries of automobile insurance subrogation is important, because that's how many cars we have in the United States more than any other country. Um, Pursuing automobile insurance subrogation is extremely important because these are the claims we will see much, much more often than any other claim. Uh, you can see the financial toll of $300 billion, 7 million auto accidents annually. Uh, during this webinar, 10 people will die in automobile accidents, so there uh, is a tremendous amount of money involved in automobile claims, and recovering back those claims becomes all the more important if for no other reason than the numbers involved. Now, when we talk about insurance in California, <clears throat> we talk, first of all, about personal auto coverage. Um, liability insurance is required in California, uh, but, of course, that doesn't mean that everyone has it. There's about 25 to 30 percent of uh, California drivers who are uninsured. But California requires minimum liability insurance in the amount of $15,000 per person, $32,000 per accident, and $5,000 per property damage. California is also a direct action state. Direct action statutes vary, but there are very few states that have them. The statutes usually provide that an injured third party has a right to directly sue the tortfeasor's insurer. This right of direct action is normally not available under common law and in normal dis, um, legal discourse, but uh, these direct action statutes may require that the injured party file one suit against the tortfeasor, obtain a judgment against the tortfeasor, and file a second lawsuit against the tortfeasor's liability insurer within a set amount of time. Um, that's the case in California. Wisconsin has a direct action statute that allows uh, the subrogated carrier or whoever to sue both the insured, I'm sorry, both the tortfeasor and the liability carrier for the tortfeasor, or to sue the liability carrier directly without suing the tortfeasor um, if under certain circumstances if they can't be found. Proposition 213 is worth mentioning because uh, it resulted, it was a, a popular referendum in 1996, which resulted in section 3333.3. That section prohibits a plan from recovering any damages if his injuries were committed um, or caused by his committing a felony or during flight from the commission of a felony. Section 3333.4, part of Proposition 213, also restricts owners and operators of vehicles injured in a motor vehicle accident. accident 
uh, from recovering non-economic losses such as pain and suffering, um, physical impairment, disfigurement, inconvenience, and other non-economic damages if the plaintiff is uninsured at the time of the accident as is required by California law. Um, also, the plaintiff cannot recover these damages if the plaintiff was driving under the influence or was convicted of uh, DUI uh, at the time of the accident. Um, when the two cross paths, in other words, uh, not insured and drunk, <laughs> when you have a drunk driver hitting an uninsured driver or vice versa, there is an exception. The uninsured driver hit by a drunk driver can recover. So I guess they put the drunk driver even below uh, the um, uninsured driver in the food chain. Medical payments, med pay coverage. There is no statutory obligation to provide med pay coverage in California, but many policies contain such provisions. Under PIP, personal injury protection coverage, California doesn't have any no-fault laws and does not require PIP. The only time you'd see them is if an out-of-state policy is involved and an accident occurs with an out-of-state resident in California. Uninsured, underinsured motorist coverage. Um, California requires that every policy uh, must be issued with um, provisions for uninsured motorist coverage with policy limits equal to the bodily injury liability limits, the previously mentioned 15 um, and 30. Um, the insurer and any named insured can agree in writing to delete the provision so they can opt out of it. Um, and it's also not necessary in California to have UIM coverage, although it is possible to obtain it. As we mentioned, there's no no-fault insurance collision, comprehensive. Um, if something happens to your car, you crash into another object, a tree falls on it, it's stolen by a thief or something along those lines, um, you, you can get collision and comprehensive coverage. For that, under the policies, the company is obligated to pay only up to the car's cash value under the terms of most policies. This means the market value of the car before the accident minus the salvage value of the damaged vehicle. For extra premiums, some insurers provide replacement cost coverage, but no, you know, no matter what kind of coverage you have, as we'll see when we talk about collision subrogation, you are still limited to the damages that your insured would have been able to recover, and he cannot recover replacement cost in a suit against a tortfeasor who uh, collides with him and damages his vehicle. Uh, just briefly, California subrogation recognizes the three types of subrogation which are um, in existence in our country. Equitable subrogation, which is common law subrogation passed down from the courts of chancery in England, uh, requires no subrogation contract, no agreement, no subrogation <coughs> policy language. It occurs as a matter of law simply when one party assumes the debt of another and is thereby uh, allowed to step into the shoes of that party and can proceed against the debtor uh, once they've paid that debt. Um, contractual subrogation is the typical insurance subrogation that we deal with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis where we rely on the policy language of the policy, which contains subrogation and or reimbursement language in it. Statutory subrogation is a little bit stronger. Statutory subrogation can include workers' compensation, or in some states, uh, med pay, UIM, Subrogation, it also includes, um, you know, you can go all the way to federal with Longshore, Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera. But usually statutory subrogation is a lot stronger and often does not carry with it the risk of being faced with the quote-unquote equitable defenses to subrogation, such as the Made Whole Doctrine, the Common Fund Doctrine, or as we will um, see in California, a few other rather peculiar defenses against subrogation. Now, the purposes of subrogation... <clears throat> Obviously, they hold the tortfeasor responsible. He doesn't get off scot-free just because the insured had insurance and doesn't want to bother with suing the tortfeasor. Uh, the subrogated carrier will sue the tortfeasor, make him or his insurance company pay, which puts the burden on the party who is the most negligent and also helps hold down premiums. And it also prevents a double recovery because if the insured was allowed to collect claims from an auto policy and then sue the tortfeasor for those same elements of damages, it would amount to 
a double recovery. Now, in California, um, whether an insured is made whole affects the type of subrogation and reimbursement uh, that is available. Uh, generally, an insurer becomes a real party in interest when it pays a claim, and the insurer may sue the third party directly. But that's only if the insured has been made whole. Um, if the insured is not made whole, that means that the insurer has made only a partial payment. In other words, the insurer has paid for damage to the vehicle, but there is some residual um, loss of value or um, uh, items of property in the vehicle or, or other property damage that has not been uh, recovered, which would then mean the insured is not made whole. In that situation, both parties have a cause of action. The insured would have a cause of action for the uninsured losses, of course, and the insurer would have a subrogation for the traditional claim payments that it made under the auto policy. Um, in that case, the insured retains the right to sue the third party, and the carrier um, retains the right to sue independently. But we're faced in California with something called <clears throat> the rule against splitting a cause of action. The, the rule against splitting of cause of action is, is this. A subrogated property insurer is not limited to intervening or seeking reimbursement. It can bring a separate, independent action to recover directly from a third-party tortfeasor. So when your auto policy contains a subrogation provision, this insurer may recover its payments directly from the tortfeasor or from the proceeds of the insured's lawsuit against the tortfeasor. Or in a partial subrogation situation, of course, this is where we paid only part of the damages and there's uninsured losses. If the insured retains the right to sue the responsible tortfeasor for uninsured losses, then the insurer has the right to sue the responsible third party for um, the loss in paying on the policy. The first alternative, bringing a second lawsuit against the responsible third party for the subrogation action, actually impairs and impedes the insurer's ability, I'm sorry, if, if, the, if the insured brings a second lawsuit against the responsible third party, we file subrogation suit, insured files a second suit, this impedes or impairs our ability to, to protect our subrogation rights because the responsible third party can defeat the subrogated lawsuit by asserting a defense known as the splitting of the cause of, splitting the cause of action. This rule Splitting the cause of action uh, prohibits a plaintiff from turning a single cause of action into the basis of several lawsuits. So a single cause of action arises when a single tortious act causes several items of property damage, while two causes of action arise when a single act causes the plaintiff to suffer both personal injury and property damage. So partial payment to the insured results in partial subrogation. The insurer is subrogated to the amount of the insurance proceeds. So you can have two separate suits if you're dealing with personal injury and property damage, but you you split the cause of action if there are different actions for property damage, one by the subrogated insurer and one by the insured. So California has that strange defense of splitting the cause of action. You need to be aware of that. And by the way, that, that defense, splitting the cause of action, can be waived by a tortfeasor who has knowledge of subrogation and yet defends a suit filed by the insured. Um, <clears throat> the carrier may be limited if the made whole doctrine applies. In California, the subrogated insurer and the insured should, if at all possible, sue the tortfeasor together to avoid defenses such as splitting of causes of action or race judicata. Race judicata, which is Latin for the thing having been adjudicated, uh, occurs where the insured may have filed suit in small claims court for a certain element of property damage, say um, uh, something valuable in the car was damaged in the collision, and so he, he or she sues for that. And then the insurance company sues for the damage to the vehicle in a second suit, not knowing about the first suit, only to discover that they are barred by race judicata as a result of the first suit. So this can be avoided by joining the insured as a co-plaintiff when you file suit. Um, damage to property and injury to person each caused by a single act 
again, are separate causes of action and may be pursued separately, but when you're dealing with property damage, you have to watch out for this splitting the cause of action. So again, there's three options for us uh, subrogation professionals when choosing to pursue subrogation or reimbursement rights. Number one, we can file an independent subrogation action, but if we do, we have to be aware uh, and, and know whether or not the insured has taken any action on his own to avoid race judicata and splitting the cause of action. That's number one. Number two, we can intervene into a pending action. And by doing so, as we'll learn, we may avoid the made whole doctrine in California. California is a little favorable on this point. And number three, we can seek reimbursement from the insured if he or she recovers damages. And the made whole doctrine will then apply. We'll get into the made whole doctrine a little later. <coughs> Now, California has another peculiar defense against potential subrogation known as the doctrine of superior equities. And in this case, um, California is one of only a few jurisdictions which recognize the doctrine of superior equities. The others are Illinois, Pennsylvania, New York, and Oklahoma. This doctrine essentially says that when a subrogated insurance company is seeking subrogation against a third party who is not the primary wrongdoer, the insurance company must show that it has superior equities. An example of this would be, a, say, a, suit, a subrogation suit filed against an apartment complex owner for failing to provide a means of disposing hot ashes after a tenant starts a fire by placing hot ashes in a flammable trash receptacle. The party primarily responsible for the fire is the tenant. Why would you put hot ashes in a, in a trash receptacle that clearly could start a fire? But we are suing the uh, apartment complex owner because they didn't provide a non-flammable um, place to put hot coals. So anyone bringing a subrogation suit against a complex owner who is only secondarily liable, they didn't start the fire, they just didn't provide a place to put the hot coals can only recover if the subrogated carrier has equal or superior equities to those of the complex owner. Generally, the carrier's equities are going to be superior to the third party because we've done nothing. We just paid the claim um, because generally the third party, the apartment complex owner, was in a better position than us, the insurance company, to avoid the loss. However, the court must differentiate between primary and secondary causes of action to determine whether the third party was in a better position to avoid the loss. So just be aware that that's a defense out there. Let's get into med pay subrogation because <clears throat> it is uh, treated differently in California than in most states. Many California policies contain a med pay provision and it provides for payment of reasonable and necessary medical bills to an insured as a result of a covered accident. Um, oh, and by the way, Jamie wanted me to remind you that um, we have uh, over 370 people attending today, uh, which is an awesome turnout, and that includes 13 conference rooms. And we will find out after the webinar how many people were in each conference room, but generally that could be anywhere from 10 to 50 people in this conference room. So this is just a tremendous turnout, and we uh, we appreciate it. Uh, hopefully this will be beneficial for everybody. But getting back to MedPay coverage, uh, this insurer provides this MedPay coverage on a no-fault basis. And in California, they have uh, a, a rule which which prohibits any assignment of a cause of action for personal injuries. Any such assignment is void. So an insurer which pays first party benefits under an auto policy is subrogated based on subrogation language in the policy to the rights of the insured against the tortfeasor. But the insurer can't assert its subrogation claim directly against the tortfeasor because an assignment of a cause of action for personal injuries is void. And in the absence of statutory authority, a cause of action for personal injury is not subject to subrogation. What would such an exception be uh, statutorily? Workers' compensation subrogation, for example, where the work comp carrier is subrogated to the rights for the personal injury uh, against the tortfeasor. And historically, at common law, the assignability of causes of action sounded in tort depended on survivability. So causes of action for damage to property, since they survived the death of the parties, were assignable. But causes of action for injury to the person, since they did not survive, were not assignable. That's the reason behind this 
prohibition, and there's probably another five or six states that have such a prohibition. And those states are <coughs> colloquially, colloquially called anti-subrogation states. Um, and California is one with regard to MedPay. So as a result of this proscription of assigning a personal injury cause of action, a true cause of action for subrogation of medical benefits, either equitable or contractual, is not allowed in California. But remember the difference between subrogation and reimbursement. In subrogation, the carrier steps into the shoes of the insured and asserts the insured's rights against the third party. But in reimbursement, the carrier has the right to seek repayment back of any, out of any third-party recovery received by the insured. And in California, while a uh, personal injury cause of action, action can't be assigned and therefore MedPay is not subrogable, it is allowed to be reimbursed. And you can seek reimbursement from the insured once he or she has made a recovery from the third-party tortfeasor. Um, however, to accomplish this, there must be appropriate reimbursement language in the policy. Policies typically have a provision requiring the insured to reimburse the carrier for monies recovered from a third party that duplicate his or her recovery under the policy. Um, but And MedPay insurers must seek recovery for personal injury claims through these, this contractual reimbursement right against their insureds because, of course, they're not allowed to pursue the tort fees because that would be an assignment of a personal injury cause of action. So California med pay provisions usually contain a reimbursement clause, and that gives us a couple of options. Um, we can either intervene into the insured's action, which I would always recommend because we might be able to get the made whole doctrine knocked out, or we can enforce a lien on the tort recovery, which means that the made whole doctrine will apply. And when the made whole doctrine applies, as we all know, it's the rule that says that the insured has to recover all elements of damages before the insurance company can subrogate. Well, how many times have we seen a plaintiff's attorney just volunteer, well, yeah, I think we've, we've actually been made whole. They will never say that. So there's always a fight on your hands. We'll talk more about that later when we talk about the made whole doctrine. Here's sample reimbursement language. Uh, under the policy, and you can see this is the uh, sort of clause that you would typically find in your policy. So that if you have that clause or something similar to it, you can seek reimbursement, but you cannot pursue subrogation for med pay. PIP, of course, um, there is no no-fault insurance in California. There's no dis cases discussing PIP subrogation. When you have out-of-state policies and you have conflict of law rules, um, which uh, you know govern what happens when you have an Arizona policy with uh, some PIP in it or a Texas policy with add-on PIP getting involved in an accident in California, that's where you deal with PIP subrogation. UM, UIM subrogation. Uh, UM subrogation and UIM subrogation in California is, is rather interesting. The history behind it is all the way back in 1959, there were only 7 million licensed drivers in California compared to 23 million today. Back then, 88% had insurance. Um, 8 million, um, or I'm sorry, 8% of those were uninsured but were financially responsible. So only 4% of drivers, about 250,000, were uninsured. As compared to today, 25%. So that's one fourth of 23 million, or you know, almost six million people, are uninsured in California. But starting in the 50s, carriers began to put "quote unquote" unsatisfied judgment endorsements in their standard auto liability policies. The premiums were cheap, and they were payable only after the insured had reduced his claim against the uninsured motorist to a judgment, and it was determined that the judgment was uncollectible. So they're a little bit different than they are today. <clears throat> But the California UM subrogation statute, uh, section 11580.2, uh, uh, was actually passed way back in 1959. And it does grant an uninsured motorist carrier subrogation rights. Uh, that's found right in the statute. An underinsurance motorist carrier, however, is not entitled to traditional subrogation rights 
but only to reimbursement. Why? <clears throat> Think back to the prohibition against the signing of cause of action for personal injuries. The UM carrier receives, instead of subrogation, a dollar-for-dollar -dollar reimbursement or credit in the amount it's insured receives from the UIM driver or that driver's carrier. In fact, UIM coverage doesn't even come into play until the limits of bodily injury liability policies applicable to all insured motor vehicles causing the injury, i.e. all tort features, have been exhausted and proof of payment is submitted to the injured party's insurer. Here's a typical uh, policy, or I'm sorry, this is uh, California Insurance Code Section 11580.2 which provides for subrogation. Here is a 2.5p, which indicates that uh, the underinsured motorist carrier is entitled to reimbursement. Here's 11.582c3, um, which indicates that uh, to bodily injury, this is an exception to coverage. Um, and the exception is to bodily injury the insured with respect to which the insured or his or her representative shall, without written consent of the insurer, make any settlement. So basically, if the insured settles without written consent of the UIM carrier, um, the, the policy is void and no benefits are owed. Under California law, the definition of uninsured motors, uh, uninsured, under, uninsured motor vehicle includes vehicles without any BI liability coverage, vehicles where liability coverage was denied, underinsured vehicles, and hit and run vehicles. <clears throat> so to recap, when dealing with UM subrogation, you are allowed to subrogate. For UIM coverage, you can seek reimbursement or a credit only. Uh, UM, UIM coverage uh, does follow that the consent to settle clause is, is upheld in California. So, um, but, but you don't have UIM substituted payments in California because, of course, there is no subrogation of UIM benefits because of the assignment of cause of action restriction. Um, the UIM carrier only pays when the third-party limits are exhausted anyway. So the, that's why there is no subrogation. But the UIM carrier has no subrogation rights. It gets a dollar-for-dollar dollar credit instead. The UI, when, when UM, uninsured motorist subrogation, is involved, the insured must strictly comply with this statutory obligation to obtain the UM carrier's consent and the carrier is not required to show prejudice before it can claim the benefit of that consent to settle provision. So again, UIM, there's no substituted payments for the reasons previously stated, and UM subrogation is allowed. And you have to give the insured have to get consent of the UM carrier before it can settle with the tortfeasor. Collision subrogation is allowed and live and well in California. Subrogation of automobile collisions is permissible and policies frequently contain subrogation clauses such as the one shown in the slide. When you do subrogate, remember you step into the shoes of the insured. This means that you are able to recover only the amount of damages that the insured would be able to recover against the tortfeasor. If your policy paid for replacement value, too bad. That's just something you paid for because you got a higher premium. You can still only recover the measure of damages, which is the lesser of the difference in market value of the vehicle before and after, or repair value, reasonable repair costs. Um, and the, the limit of a company's liability for loss will not exceed the actual cash value of the damaged property. So this, this is set in California law. Again, the measure of damages in cases involving damage to vehicles is the difference in the market value of the vehicle before and after the accident. However, if the vehicle can be repaired at an expense that's less than that difference between market value before and after, the measure of damages is then the reasonable cost of repair. And if the reasonable cost of repairs is sought, it's unnecessary to prove that the car has actually been repaired, just what the reasonable cost of repairs would be. 
So loss of use is also a recoverable, recoverable element of damage in California. Loss of use of property is different from loss of property. If a vehicle is stolen, the value of the loss of use of the car is the rental value of a substitute vehicle. The value of the loss of the car is its replacement cost. So loss of use is the measure of damages for the loss of use of personal property. And it may be determined uh, by showing the rental value of similar property, which the plaintiff could hire for use during the period where he is deprived of the use of his property. Uh, loss of use is recoverable where the vehicle is damaged or destroyed. That's unlike Texas and some other states. And it's measured by the rental value and recoverable even if no rental car is obtained. So you can recover repair values even though there were no repair is made. And you can recover loss of use even though no rental vehicle is obtained. <clears throat> A subrogated property insurer is not limited to intervening or seeking reimbursement. It can bring a separate independent action to recover directly from the third-party tortfeasor. Therefore, where a subrogation provision exists in the policy, uh, the property, uh, the, the auto insurer may recover its payments directly from the tortfeasor or from the proceeds of the insurance action against the tortfeasor. It's his, its choice. In a partial subrogation situation, if the insured retains the right to sue the responsible party for any loss not fully compensated by the insurance, then the insurer has the right to sue and bring its own lawsuit for subrogation. Both alternatives are, in practice, um, uh, used. But the first alternative, bringing a second lawsuit, impedes or impairs the insurer's ability to protect subrogation rights again. So you, you, can, you can only file a separate lawsuit again if the insured is made whole for property damage. Otherwise, you're splitting the cause of action. We go back to that again. But a single cause of action arises when a single tort, a single negligent act, a single collision causes um, several items of property damage, so you can't split that cause of action. But remember, two separate causes of action arise when a single tortious act causes the plaintiff to suffer both personal injury and property damage. Um, what happens when an insured settles directly with a tortfeasor who has no knowledge that the insured has received benefits from the subrogated carrier and settles in good faith. Uh, whatever rights of subrogation the insurer may have had against the tortfeasor, they are destroyed. If a release is signed by the third party in good faith, the carrier's rights go away. On the other hand, if the tortfeasor settles and has knowledge of the insurer's subrogation interest, then those subrogation rights are still intact. When a third-party liability carrier knows about a valid lien on the proceeds of a settlement, there is a duty to place the lien holder's name on the settlement check. And that's been established by the California Court of Appeals in 1999. Failure to do so is considered to be interference with a prospective economic advantage. And those are words that can be used on a, on a notice letter to the third party to remind them of that duty so they don't simply go settle and leave the insured to fend for itself against you, the subrogated carrier. But the result is different where the insured obtains a judgment against the <clears throat> tortfeasor in a small claims court, and the insurer subsequently tries to proceed with an action against the tortfeasor. As we discussed earlier, because the insurer's claim, subrogation claim, is derived solely from subrogation of the insured's rights against the tortfeasor, the insured small claims ju court judgment against the tortfeasor actually bars us from later subrogating for damages arising from the same incident. So uh, otherwise, we'd be splitting the cause of action. <clears throat> and this is true even if there's different damages or if the defendant knows of subrogation. So what happens now when you make a demand and the third-party tortfeasor's insurer sends you a check for 40% of what you've asked for. And they have on the back paid in full and full satisfaction of subrogation lien or whatever. Um, we need to know what happens when the insurer tries to release um, or get a, is, is released, releases the tortfeasor because it receives some small settlement for some other elements of damages. 
If an insured settles directly with a tortfeasor who has no knowledge that the insured has received benefits from the subrogated carrier and settles in good faith, those rights, of course, are destroyed. Oh. I'm sorry, I'm, when we, I'm, I'm talking now about accord and satisfaction. When, um, uh, when you get that check from the tortfeasor and it says, for total loss to vehicle or uh, payment in full, there there used to be a a uh, difference of opinion in California as to whether or not you signing that check and cashing it actually barred you from proceeding for the rest of your claim. The California Civil Code used to say you could strike out the payment in full language. The Uniform Commercial Code, Section 3311, said no. Nope full satisfaction language is effective. Later on, the Supreme Court played umpire, and it decided that Section 3311 superseded Section 1526. So the rule now is if you take a check and it has that full satisfaction language on the back, you are going to be barred from proceeding for the rest. Don't simply cash a partial check. Send it back and say, no, we'd like all of our money, not just part of the money. So let's talk about now the made whole doctrine. Most of us are familiar with the doctrine. Um, made whole doctrine prevents an insurer from recovering any third party funds paid to the insured until the insured has been fully compensated for his or her injuries, according to the California Supreme Court. This doctrine has been viable in California since 1974. Uh, the doctrine usually applies only when there is no agreement to the contrary. And we'll get into that because California provides some really innovative and cool ways for us to avoid the application of the made whole doctrine, and we should take advantage of them. The made whole doctrine was extended to med pay subrogation for the first time only recently in 2005. In California, the subrogation rights and reimbursement rights of a first-party no-fault med pay insurer fall under the, the auspices of subrogation, and therefore both are limited by the made whole doctrine. California recognizes the made whole doctrine when, typically due to third-party underinsurance, minimum limits, etc., the tortfeasor can't pay the entire debt. But the applicability of the Maidhole Doctrine generally depends on whether the insured has been completely compensated for all elements of damages, not merely for, for those which the insured has indemnified the insured for. It applies to both subrogation and reimbursement. And wh when you are t determining whether someone is made whole, you put on a piece of paper the amount of money the insured recovered in, the, in, the, in his tort case against the third party. Add to that the amount of insurance benefits. Then you figure out what his total damages are. And if his recovery for both of those elements combined exceeds the damages, then he's been made whole. Now, the exceptions to the made whole doctrine are really very clever, and uh, we should make use of them. <clears throat> um, although. California applies the Maidhole Doctrine, it does not apply it as a blanket rule. It does not apply in cases where the insurance policy says it does not apply. It does not apply in cases where the insurance policy conveys, quote, all right of recovery against any party for loss to the extent that payment, therefore, is made by this company, close quote. That's actually um, from the Travelers Indemnity Company versus Inga Britson case, a California Court of Appeals case in 1974. Language to that effect um, may destroy the made whole doctrine <clears throat> and avoid it and, uh, and avoid uh, its effect on limiting your subrogation uh, recovery. However, in that Ing Inga Britson case that I mentioned, it should be noted that the insured and the insured executed a, um, oh, a detailed subrogation agreement after the loss and at the time the insured paid uh, the insured was paid and the court also noted that the insurer's priority to the recovered funds was conditioned on it having cooperated and assisted in the recovery from the third party 
So even when it's not possible to determine what portion of the recovery represents the damages paid by the insurance company, the language which reads all right of recovery in the policy uh, obviates the need for the insurer to prove what portion of the judgment was attributable to the covered loss. So if a if claimant's attorney, insurance attorney, uh, plaintiff's attorney tries to tell you you have to do that, you do not. And you can cite that Ingbertson case to him, which is uh, at 38 Cal App 3rd, 858, the 1974 Court of Appeals case. So the requirements to eliminate the application of the Maidhole Doctrine set forth in the Ingebrigtsen case are strictly applied in California, where a policy subrogation language is general in nature, or the insurer does not participate or cooperate with the insured in the third-party recovery, the insured retains the right of priority over any recovery, and the Maidhole Doctrine will prevent subrogation. So it is possible to contract around the Maidhole Doctrine. Um, Language such as uh, the insurance company has all rights of recovery to the extent of its payment, uh, and similar language overrides the common law made whole doctrine. But California has one additional requirement in addition to the language overriding the made whole doctrine. Uh, in addition to having the right disclaimer policy language, the carrier must cooperate and assist the insured in the subrogation effort. What does that mean for you? It means that you must engage subrogation counsel. Made whole is an all or nothing proposition. It's essentially if the insured is made whole, you get nothing, no matter how much time and money and energy you've spent in a case. So you can overcome that made whole doctrine in California if you have the right policy language, which can be broad. Uh, I mean, there's many different types of language that will allow uh, it to overcome the Maidhole Doctrine, and the carrier must participate in the um, uh, effort to recover the uh, third-party funds. Now, one last note <clears throat> is that California has sort of thrown a monkey wrench into our ability to get around the Maidhole Doctrine. Although it's not a very strong monkey wrench, what they've done is they've brought the concept of unconscionability into the picture. Um, California has, in the Samura versus Kaiser Foundation Plan case, Supreme Court noted that it was unaware of any cases in which the doctrine of unconscionability had been applied, but went on to say that where this disclaimer of the made whole doctrine in the policy and the commensurate uh, active participation by the subrogation carrier is applied. Where it operates in a, quote, harsh and one-sided manner, close quote, without justification, it might be considered unconscionable. Now, however, that, that Samura versus Kaiser Foundation health plan case, which was 1993, there hasn't been much since then, and they admit that there's really nothing in the uh, <coughs> California law to allow it, but it's out there. So you might hear about that, but there isn't a whole lot to substantiate it. Now, the, the made whole doctrine um, depends on whether the insured has been made whole, but California holds that the insurance companies are entitled to reimbursement under a med pay provision even though the insured has not been reimbursed for all of his attorney's fees. And if you think about it, that makes sense because it's, it would be impossible for the insured to ever be made whole if you don't count attorney's fees as part of the recovery. For an example, if the carrier pays the insured $1,000 in MedPay benefits, third-party recovery is $6,000, which are her total damages, the insured's attorney's fee is $2,000, leaving a net recovery of four. The carrier seeks reimbursement of one. The insured argues her damages, including attorney's fees, are eight, because her damages are six, plus she had to pay two to her attorney. And because her recovery is only $6,000, therefore she is not made whole. The law in California is that the fees are not included as part of the insured's damages, and the insured is made whole under these conditions. Uh, the made whole doctrine is, while it was extended to med pay subrogation in 2005, an underinsured motorist carrier 
is entitled to reimbursement from the tortfeasor without regard to whether the insured has been made whole. Uh, as a 1991 California Court of Appeals case which holds that. On the other hand, an uninsured motorist carrier is not entitled to subrogation until the insured, the injured party has been made completely whole. So <clears throat> let's move on to um, the, a second equitable defense known as the Common Fund Doctrine. In California, this is referred to as the pro rata rule. The rule is when multiple persons are entitled to a specific fund created by an action brought by a plaintiff, such plaintiff or plaintiffs may be awarded attorney's fees out of the fund from those who benefit. Who are we? We are the ones who benefit. And what does the common fund doctrine, the pro rata rule say? It says that we, the insurance company, must pay a pro rata share <coughs> of the attorney's fees out of our subrogation recovery. With regard to the common fund doctrine, California law requires only that the insurer bear a pro rata share of the attorney's fees. And um, California case law under pro rata sharing uh, says that the insurer pays all the attorney's fees attributable to recovering the med pay expenses for which it seeks reimbursement, while the insured pays fees incurred in pursuing recovery for additional damages like pain and suffering. Now, think, think about this. This is actually a nice way to combat the made whole doctrine, which applies a little more stringently in states like uh, Wisconsin, where where the in, insured is or, or and his attorney are seeking attorney's fees out of our subrogation interest for recovering the uh, third party monies, we can say that we're only responsible for paying a pro rata share of the attorney's fees which are, are attributable to recovering the med pay expenses. Uh, however, the common fund doctrine does not apply where the subrogated carrier has retained its own separate counsel to participate in the litigation. Let me say that again. The common fund doctrine does not apply where the subrogated carrier has retained its own separate counsel to, to participate in the litigation. This means that the, the common fund doctrine rewards an active litigant only where there are other passive members of the group who, be, who benefit from the outcome. So this is another reason to get subrogation counsel involved in California subrogation cases because not only will it help defeat the made whole doctrine, it will also help defeat the common fund doctrine, which means that you could recover 100% of your lien without any uh, pro rata common fund fees being deducted from it. <clears throat> Getting to another rule, um, which is an equitable common, common law rule, which has come down, it's the economic loss doctrine, this rule generally will apply where you have damage to a product, usually a vehicle that starts on fire for some reason in a garage, in a parking lot, burns up the car, it could be an RV, a motorhome, a truck, tractor trailer, but what happens is there's some defect, either manufacturing defect or a design defect or some defect by the manufacturer which causes a vehicle to start on fire. The rule says that a party suffering only property damage to a vehicle as a result of the defect, a defect or failure of the vehicle may recover damages for that harm from the manufacturer based only on a contractual claim and not on any tort theory such as negligence or product liability. Uh, states differ as to how they apply this economic loss doctrine, but in California, you cannot sue the manufacturer if the only loss is for damage to the property or the product itself. But there are exceptions. In California, you can have exceptions where there is damage to other property. So we could certainly sue for damage to the house, damage to vehicles around that car, damage to vehicle or property in the car that we paid for. Um, if other property is damaged, <coughs> or where there's a special relationship between the plaintiff and the defendant. The plaintiff 
must be an intended beneficiary of the defendant's obligation under the contract. The loss must be foreseeable. And there must be a high degree of certainty that the plaintiff would suffer loss from the defendant's conduct. Uh, there must be a close connection between the conduct and the loss. But just remember that there is a special relationship exception. And third, um, you can, if there's a component part that isn't integrated into the product, you may be able to recover for uh, damage to the vehicle and fraud tortious breach of contract where that's involved, deceit, undue coercion, coercion or intentional breach, uh, where those things are involved, you can have an exception to this economic loss doctrine. But of course, remember, if you can show that the fire to the vehicle was caused not by a defect in the, by the manufacturer, but rather maybe negligent repair, <clears throat> maybe it was taken in for a tune-up, uh, maybe they had some parts replaced at the gas station, and shortly thereafter, the car starts on fire. Under those circumstances, you can certainly proceed against the repairman or the service station or the dealership, which did the repairs, because they're not the manufacturer. The idea behind the economic loss doctrine is um, that they tried to... <coughs> um, uh, they tried to differentiate between contract and tort claims. The law felt that a consumer should be able to pursue his warranty remedies only when the injury is to the product alone. The court also the courts also say that uh, the consumer shouldn't bear the risk that a product will cause physical injury, so you can recover for that, but should bear the risk that a product will not match his economic expectations. Well, it's a little funny if you buy a new car and the car suddenly just burns up. Yeah, I would say that doesn't match our economic expectations. But the law says, sorry, um, you can only um, pursue your warranty claim against the manufacturer. So in any fire loss where you have damage to a vehicle, always check to see if there's a warranty. Because just like a statute of limitations, a warranty can run out. Get a copy of the warranty. Find how long, out how, how long the warranty is. If you have newer vehicles, or in the case of more expensive vehicles, maybe sometimes as, as long as seven years, or extended warranties up to 10 years long, to discover whether or not you have any warranties on these claims, because that may be the linchpin by which you can recover against the manufacturer. Uh, deductible reimbursements. California insurance regulations contains a provision regarding the reimbursement of an insurance deductible in both automobile and property insurance segregation. And there it is. It's regulation, Code of Regulations 2695.7. As a result of this regulation, the insured's deductible must be included, included in any subrogation demand. The plain meaning of this regulation is that the subrogated carrier, the insurer, seeking settlement from a tortfeasor must seek recovery of the deductible, including in the, included in the demand letter, but it does not authorize an insurer to recover a deductible in litigation without the um, uh, insured being, being a party to the suit. So California courts have not conferred standing upon an insurer to seek its non-party insured's deductible in a lawsuit to recover a deductible. The insured will have to be named in the suit. So that brings up another interesting procedural aspect for naming uh, this, you know, in the suit. If you just sue in the name of the insurance company, the defendant might say, well, okay, here's your $3,000, but I've taken off your $500 deductible because under California law, you're not authorized to seek that deductible. So you either have to get permission, get an assignment, or just name the insured in the lawsuit. The collateral source rule is an interesting aspect to subrogation in California. The rule simply says and this is the same in most states. If an injured party receives benefits from an insurance policy or some other source independent of the third-party tortfeasor defendant in the case, such benefits received will not be deducted from the damages awarded to the plaintiff. Uh, California recognizes this rule. And it's a rule of evidence which really prevents evidence of collateral source payments, such as med pay benefits, from being introduced into evidence and tainting the jury, unless there is an indication that evidence of subpayment, uh, such payments have been um, 
uh, are, are relevant for something else, but generally that's not going to be the case. Because the only reason they'd be introduced by the defendant is to reduce the damages and have the jury go, oh, well, if they've already recovered these med pay benefits, we're not going to award the plaintiff all of his or her medical benefits and medical expenses that were resulted. But there are some exceptions. If a government entity, such as a city, town, county, state, has been sued or named as a defendant, the rule still prohibits the introduction of collateral source payments, but after the verdict uh, or um, a hearing will be held in which the governmental entity can ask for a reduction of the judgment based on those payments. Um, uninsured motorist benefits. These UM benefits received by an insured uh, because of the injuries caused by a hit and run driver are not considered collateral source benefits and they are available as a set off to defendants who are involved in the collision as joint tort feasors with a hit and run driver. Retail versus wholesale medical expenses, this is a brand new or relatively new case, Howell versus Hamilton Meats and Provisions, where the plaintiff seeks damages for past medical expenses and the amount billed for medical services substantially exceeds the amount actually paid by the insurance company or health plan. The plaintiff is limited to recovering the amount that was actually paid or incurred for past services, whether by the plaintiff or an independent source. The plaintiff may recover no more than the reasonable value of the medical services provided, but is not entitled to recover the reasonable value if the actual loss was less. This is because in California, to recover medical expenses, they must be both reasonable and incurred. Another exception is uh, Section 3333.1. Um, in medical malpractice cases, evidence of collateral sources can be introduced, uh, after which the plaintiff can introduce evidence of the premiums paid to acquire such insurance benefits. But instead of precluding the insured from recovering such damages, the statute merely allows the jury to look at the evidence and decide how to apply the evidence. <clears throat> However, no subrogation is allowed against malpracticing doctors or carriers anyway under this statute. So, But uh, Section 3333.4, as you recall, if a driver is DUI uh, or is not insured, he may not recover economic damages. So that's kind of an interesting aspect to the collateral source rule. California is a pure comparative fault state. Only 13 states have pure comparative fault laws. What does that mean? It means that plaintiff's damages award will be reduced by the percentage of fault that the court assigns to the plaintiff. And as an example, if the plaintiff is 75% at fault and $100,000 is awarded in damages, the plaintiff recovers only $25,000. <clears> the other states that follow this pure comparative um, um, well, they, it's only, there's only 13 other states that do that, but California uh, does so, and it's something to be considered when subrogating, because if you have an insured who is partly at fault, but it doesn't look like there'll be a counterclaim against you, then you can subrogate even if you think the plaintiff might be 50% or more at fault, and that's something the defendants have to take into consideration as well. The sudden emergency doctrine, as it's known in most other states, is known as the doctrine of imminent peril in, um, Cal in California. California adheres to this doctrine, but refers to it, of course, as the doctrine of imminent peril. A person confronted with a sudden emergency is held to a lesser standard of care under the circumstances when confronted with a sudden emergency. However, this doctrine of imminent peril does not apply to a person whose conduct causes or contributes to the imminent peril. The doctrine applies not only to when a person perceives danger to himself, but also when he perceives an imminent danger to others. Whether the conditions exist for the application of this imminent peril defense is a question of fact. Uh, as an example, if a wheel comes off a trailer on a freeway, causes the car behind to swerve, the defendant must exercise judgment and prudence required not just of the average reasonable person, but the average reasonable person who is unexpectedly confronted with an imminent peril. What do people do when a, a tire comes bouncing toward their windshield? Well, people react differently. Someone might swerve. Someone might slam on the brakes. 
uh, someone might duck down, all three actions which may cause an accident, and that may be reasonable. However, would they slam the, acceler uh, the accelerator to the ground and hold it there for five minutes while the car careens down the freeway all the while with their eyes closed? You know, no, I don't think so. I think that's an overreaction, and ultimately that's a question of fact for the jury. But the doctrine of imminent peril is something that we have to be aware of when subrogating auto accidents and auto subrogation. Another concept that we have to be aware of is the seatbelt defense. California is one of only 15 states which feels that while an accident itself may have caused the driver's negligence, or it may have been caused by the tortfeasor's negligence rather, the actual injury for which the damages are sought is often exacerbated or compounded by a second collision which occurs in the vehicle as a result of the plaintiff not wearing his or her seatbelt. So in California, juries are allowed to hear evidence of seatbelt non-use to prove comparative fault. So if you think you have a 50-50 proposition in an intersection collision, you know, it's comparative fault state. Even if they put 60% on your plaintiff, you'll still recover 40% of your damages, assuming that the other side isn't suing you back for a similar amount and for which they'll get 60%, then you'll end up owing money. But in addition to that 50% fault, you will have to consider the jury will add some percentage for the failure to use the seatbelt. Now, a violation of the California seatbelt statute does not constitute negligence as a matter of law or negligence per se. Um, that's true even though there is a law requiring use of the seatbelt. The, seat, the statute, the California statute, does not, Section 27315, does not totally ban use of seat, uh, the seatbelt statute as a factor in determining negligence. In California, for purposes of determining comparative fault, not only may the jury learn of the plaintiff's failure to use his or her seatbelt, the jury then decides what weight to give it, if any, when determining uh, the damages to be awarded and the percentages to be assigned. Something else all subrogation practitioners in California must be aware of was is something known as the Deep Pocket Initiative, Proposition 51, passed back in 1986. This was under the California Fair Responsibility Act. Previously, <clears throat> prior to this, uh, this act, a defendant with minimal negligence, for example, 5%, could end up paying for the entire loss under joint and several liability. If you recall joint and several liability, it essentially is a rule of law in our country which says that if you have three defendants whose actions jointly uh, cause a single injury to a plaintiff, the plaintiff can sue all three, and all three are jointly and severally liable. In other words, they all owe 100% of the damages. If one pays 70% of the damages, uh, the other must come up with the remaining 30%, or I can recover all the damages against any one of them. And then that defendant has to go against the other defendants and seek contribution for, for their shares of the damages. But California felt it was a little unfair because the defendant was saying 5% negligence could end up paying for the entire loss. So Proposition 51 abolished joint and several liability for non-economic damages in personal injury, property damage, and wrongful death cases. What does that mean? It means that Prop 51 probably won't affect property subrogation too much, but if you're uh, subrogating um, any, anything else, um, there is no joint and several liability for non-economic damages. Non-economic damages are things like pain and suffering, mental anguish, physical disablement, loss of enjoyment of life, care, counsel, attention, affection, uh, in the case of wrongful death cases. So we should be aware of uh, Proposition 51 and its effect on subrogation. A couple of concepts that we should be aware of, <clears throat> the guest statute. Uh, most states had guest statutes in the early 1970s. These statutes said that a social passenger or a family member couldn't sue the driver. They were intended to pr prevent collusion. Uh, two guys driving along saying, okay, you smashed the car into a wall, 
and I'll claim injury and recover money and we'll split it. Well, <clears throat> the guest statute was declared unconstitutional by the California Supreme Court in 1973, so it's no longer applicable. Another doctrine that exists in other states but no longer exists in California is the family purpose doctrine. That's a rule that holds that the owner of an automobile is liable for damages to others while a family of the uh, a member of the family is driving the vehicle. So if dad lets son take the family car and son kills somebody in the family car, dad is liable, just as if he was driving himself. California says no go on that. They say in the absence of such a statute, parents are no longer liable for the negligent acts of their children simply because they are driving um, the family car. Now there are two exceptions to this that allow for vicarious liability. Vicarious liability, of course, is liability impugned to one party as a result of the actions of another party, as a result of a relationship they have. Negligent entrustment is one such example. Uh, one who places or entrusts his automobile in the hands of someone who he knows or from the circumstances should know is incompetent or unfit to drive may be held liable for an injury inflicted by the use of that uh, vehicle by the driver, provided that the plaintiff can establish that the injury was proximately caused by the driver's disqualification, incompetency, inexperience, or recklessness. In other words, if I negligently entrust a vehicle to a guy who I know is an, an incompetent driver with 600 accidents on his record, and he's driving safely and gets in an accident, and it's not his fault, then um, I won't be held responsible for under negligent entrustment. Uh, liability for negligent entrustment amounts to a determination of whether a duty exists to anticipate and guard against the negligence of others. And a person is only liable for damages caused by negligent entrustment which are reasonably foreseeable to that person. So I might entrust a vehicle to someone who is negligent and reckless, um, <clears throat> and then they are driving and a tire blows out on the vehicle and the car flips over and kills someone else. Well, I'm not responsible for that because those damages weren't caused by the negligent entrustment and weren't reasonably foreseeable to me as a, as a result of um, entrusting the vehicle to that careless person. However, there, uh, California has one very important additional vicarious liability statute that we need to be aware of. It's known as the permissive user vicarious liability. Section 17150 of the California Code says, um, and I'll read the statute in its entirety. It's short. It's one sentence long, but it's important. It says, liability of private owners. Every owner of a motor vehicle is liable and responsible for the death or injury to person or property resulting from a negligent or wrongful act or omission in the operation of a motor vehicle in the business of the owner or otherwise by any person using or operating the same with the permission expressed or implied of the owner. This means that if the owner of a vehicle gives express or implied permission to someone to use that vehicle and the driver either negligently or intentionally causes injury, death, or property damage, the vehicle owner is vicariously liable. Now liability under that section is limited to $15,000 per person, $30 per occurrence, and $5,000 for property damage. Those are the uh, liability uh, insurance minimum limits in California. And, but there is no limit against the driver, however, and, and this statute does not limit the liability of the owner based on another viable legal theory such as negligent entrustment, um, vicarious liability of an employer for acts of an employee or failure to maintain breaks because remember negligent entrustment can mean not simply getting a, a, a vehicle in good shape to an individual who is reckless, it can mean giving a, a vehicle which is not in good shape, not well man to maintain to an excellent driver and the resulting accident is the fault of the vehicle that you entrusted to him and if you gave that vehicle to someone knowingly with the defects it had in it and the maintenance problems, and while it wasn't in good repair, you can be liable for negligent entrustment as well. 
Uh, a plaintiff utilizing and pleading the permissive use of vicarious liability statute must sue both the owner and the driver for the statute to apply. And then the vicariously liable owner has the right to seek contribution from the driver. Dram shop liability. Dram shop liability in most states has to do with the liability of a bar, restaurant, um, tavern, nightclub, or in some states, even a social host. You hosting a Christmas party at your house, uh, a law firm holding a uh, Christmas party at, at, in their building. Um, the liability they have if someone gets intoxicated by being overserved and then goes out and hurts, kills, or damages property. California, uh, and this is kind of amazing given some of the uh, the political leanings in California, that they they do not enforce dram shop liability. Um, you know, I, you would think it'd be a very tort friendly place, but although it's a misdemeanor to serve alcohol beverages to any habitual or common drunkard or to anyone who is obviously intoxicated. No person who supplies alcohol can be found liable of negligent acts of the one consuming the alcohol. This is because California considers the negligent consumption of alcohol by the patron to be the proximate cause of the resulting injuries, not the serving of the alcohol. And that's found in um, California uh, Business and Professional Code 25602 and also the California Spring case of Corey versus Sherlow. So no dram shop liability. In California, we have the statute of limitations is generally two years. This includes med pay subrogation. Um, again, we can't file our own med pay subrogation suits, but the suits in which we intervene have to be filed two years from the date of the accident. Property damage is three years. Uninsured motorist subrogation is three years from the date of the UM payment. And remember, there is no UIM subrogation, again, the proscription against assignment of a cause of action for personal injuries. Uh, but interestingly, when you have to give notice to governmental entities and in order to uh, <clears throat> proceed with tort against most governmental entities, you have to have some sort of um, notice given to that entity. In California, the time period runs from the date of payment of the claim, not from the date of the incident. So that's um, a development that's favorable to subrogated carriers. One of the big problems we have in subrogating auto claims, of course, is the small $900 case, the $1,100 case in which the third party liability carrier you send your demand letter to just files it in the circular file and sends you back your obligatory letter, which is just a big middle finger saying, come and get me, because even if you come and get me, the most I'm going to have to pay is this $1,100, so I'm really not scared. Um, we can make them a little more scared based on um, the offer of judgment law in California. The Civil Procedure Code, Section 998, says that if plaintiff submits, if you submit a written offer <clears throat> no less than 10 days before trial, and this could be your demand letter, if that offer is not accepted within 30 days or trial, whichever is less, and if the defendant fails to get a more favorable verdict, so in your demand, if you're looking for $1,000, say, I'll take 995 If the defendant fails to get a more favorable verdict, and if, if the verdict is more than the offer, the court may award discretionary experts costs, fees, and things of that nature. So you can put some additional pressure on them, and they may think, wow, I might end up owing more in costs than the the thousand dollars that I may being asked to pay here and they may pony up some or all of it. However, if the verdict is less than the offer, the plaintiff can't recover costs and the plaintiff may owe the defendant's post offer costs. So something to consider when you're dealing with some of those smaller subrogation cases. Uh, that concludes uh, the overview of California uh, automobile insurance subrogation. I would again remind you that the book contains a lot more information, automobile insurance, subrogation in all 50 states. It's available through our website. It's also available through Juris, J-U-R-I-S, publishers.com. They're out of New York, and they've been very good to us. They've published all four of our books from uh, Fundamentals of Insurance Coverage, Workers' Compensation Subrogation in all 50 states, ERISA and Health Insurance Subrogation in all 50 states, and, of course, 
automobile insurance in all 50 states. We've self-published our book, Where's the Beef, which is the uh, <clears throat> a book that we have here which deals with cattle, livestock, automobile collision cases. When you have the guy driving over the hill and runs into a, a steer and the car is totaled, um, the, lo the law and the history of the laws of all 50 states with regard to how you can proceed against the owner of that livestock, open range, closed range, stock laws of all 50 states, including the history, statute of limitations, and uh, is all contained in the book, Where's the Beef? That you can get um, directly from us by just emailing uh, Jamie here in our office. You can email me, and we'll be sure to um, give you all the information you need on that. Um, we appreciate uh, your time. Please consider using Matisse and Wicker and Lair for your subrogation needs in all 50 states, Mexico, Canada, but certainly in California, where I think we've shown that having active subrogation counsel is vitally important and can help you overcome some of the defenses which hamper subrogation in other states. So it's a complicated state to subrogate in, but it has many advantages which hopefully we'll be able to help you take advantage of. Appreciate your time, and we look forward to uh, um, uh, hearing from you again and hopefully working with you on some of your cases. I know there's a number of existing clients in the audience, and we do thank you for attending. Thank you. Bye-bye.